Perfecto. Hola, buenos días a todos. Eh, hoy tenemos el placer desde el Servicio de Neurocirugía de, de dar acogida a la sesión general del hospital eh, con una persona eh, especial, que es el doctor Marek Chosnika. Eh, Marek Chosnika, eh, para aquellos que, que no lo conozcáis, es... Eh, una de las piezas más importantes del conocimiento actual de la presión intracraneal, de la dinámica del líquido cefalorraquídeo y de muchas otras partes importantes de la fisiología del sistema nervioso central. Eh, él es polaco, nació en Varsovia en el año 55, se graduó en la Universidad de Varsovia en, en el 79, lleva trabajando en la Universidad de Cambridge desde el año 91, en el año 2003 eh, fue nombrado Reader in Brain Physics por la Universidad de Cambridge y ostenta uno de los más altos honores para un universitario eh, polaco, que es el, el nombramiento de, de Belvedere Professor, que se lo, se lo instituyó directamente el presidente de Polonia en el año 2006 y es catedrático de eh, física cerebral por la Universidad de Cambridge desde el año 2003. Marek cuenta con más de mil publicaciones y más de 30.000 citaciones y, y sus principales áreas de interés son el, el, la monitorización del paciente crítico. Hay muchos eh, parámetros que utilizamos eh, diariamente en las unidades de neurocríticos o que intentamos utilizar, que, que ha popularizado el doctor Chosnika, como puede ser el RAP Index, el RX eh, y otros muchos. Eh, es uno de los impulsores del sistema de monitorización multimodal ICM Plus, que, que utiliza muchas unidades de neurocríticos a lo largo de todo el, la, el mundo. Y eh, dentro de la, de, la, de la parte clínica en la, en, de neurocirugía, pues es el, el, el director de la, de la unidad de, de, eh, de hidrocefalia, de, de investigación de hidrocefalia y del... del único laboratorio de valoración de eh, válvulas de derivación ventricular eh, independiente, que está situado también en Cambridge. Además, tiene una dimensión docente muy importante. Si tenéis la oportunidad y estáis interesados en el tema, todos eh, los eh, martes tiene, tiene una, un, unos seminarios de, de física cerebral a las, a la, entre las 11 y las 12 de la mañana, que la, se puede acceder a través de de internet solicitándolo a través de correo, el correo lo tenéis por ahí en la, en la, en la diapositiva y también ha hecho eh, a, a, eh, posible que, que todos tengamos pues, las clases que él da, tanto en formato PPT como en vídeo, las clases que él da en la, en la facultad y que, y que de verdad que son súper son interesantes. Y bueno, sin más, eh, es un privilegio y un honor tenerle aquí Sentimos mucho que por las circunstancias de la pandemia no haya podido estar eh, presencialmente, pero esperamos poder tenerle aquí presencialmente pronto. Thank you very much, Mark, for being here. It's a great pleasure for us that you uh, agreed to, to give us uh, the lecture. I know we are going to enjoy it. Thank you very much, and we hope we can have you here uh, in person soon. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. So, I should start. So, to start, I need to share my screen. Okay, I will stop sharing your screen and start with my screen. Okay, great. And then I, what I need to do, I need to show this in this mode. And then I need to set my pointer. Great. Okay, do you hear me? Hello. Ruben, do you hear me? Good, great. So, I can start. <laughs>
Thank you very much for inviting me to Santander. Uh, it's a great place. I've once been close to Santander in my life. Unfortunately, because of the COVID restrictions, long journeys are not visible. Multimodal brain monitoring and the contemporary view of, uh, in fact, uh, modalities, those modalities which we call them invasive, is a subject of my presentation today. We started, if you don't know where to start with, you start with history. We started some 30 years ago when Professor Picard, Professor of Neurosurgery in Cambridge, invited us to come from Poland and uh, start measurements in a brain physics laboratory. The name was very different at the very beginning. Now we call it Brain Physics Laboratory. And this lecture is on behalf of Brain Physics Laboratory uh, fellows and PhD students. Before I start, really, I need to show you very briefly my disclosure. Uh, the most important part of this is that I have uh, um, uh, financial interest in a, in, a, in a tiny part of licensing fee for ICM Plus software. And about ICM Plus software, I will tell you a little bit more at the end of my presentation. Brain is a lamp in a box. And in fact, that was Professor Picard who probably uh, uh, used this phrase to explain uh, principles of invasive multimodal monitoring. So first, and the longest part of the presentation will be about the elements of multimodal monitoring. And then, I will uh, tell you a little bit about integration. Integration deserves really separate lecture, but uh, we have only one hour or 40 minutes for all of this. So I start with elements. First, intracranial pressure, first element, intracranial pressure and derived indices, indices which can be monitored in time and are derived from intracranial pressure. First of all, beginning of intracranial pressure monitoring. First monitoring by um, French scientists, then Lundberg in 1960s uh, uh, published this very important work showing that intracranial pressure, in fact, is more than the number. It's not a set value. It fluctuates continuously. These are plateau waves of intracranial pressure. You can appreciate this, that ICP increasing from normal values around 15 millimeter of mercury up to 60 millimeter of mercury and then goes back and again and again and again. This action is not always that much periodical like it is presented in another um, uh, recording of, of Professor Lundberg here. Nevertheless, this should be uh, considered. Continuous recording of intracranial pressure, it's very much important because value of intracranial pressure may be not stable. Lundberg used external pressure transducer. Therefore, there was a lot of problems and uh, these are problems for those who are using this up to date. Uh, first of all, the problem with uh, long-term uh, acquired infections of cerebrospinal fluid. At the moment, at the present, we are using intraparenchymal transducers like this collection, Camino, Codban, Tessio, Raumedic, uh, 
maybe some new. And uh, uh, the pressure is uh, measured with microchip put directly into brain parenchyma. These measurements uh, minimizes, in fact, the rate of infections, but also produces some other measuring problems. First of all, it's a possibility of zero drift, mean value of measured pressure may drift in time, and this is mainly electronical drift. And also the pressure, it's no longer the pressure in the fluid, in the cerebrospinal fluid, but in a, uh, let's say, semi-solid state, brain parenchyma. So it's not very well defined. In a fluid, pressure is distributed according to the Pascal law everywhere equally. In brain parenchyma, there may be the difference of the pressure from point to point. And those people who are using, for example, from mm, clinical reasons to intraparenchyma transducers noticed that they may be the difference on average it is six millimeter of mercury between transducers but it may be as high as 20 millimeter of mercury so intracranial pressure we are measuring contemporary is not that well defined little bit about patterns uh, of intracranial pressure. I will show you only two, but there is uh, much more. You can read about this in uh, our, our lectures of brain physics. This is elevated and stable intracranial pressure. What I mean, look at this. Pressure is elevated above 20 millimeter of mercury, and in many centers, ICP above 20 millimeter of mercury is considered as elevated, really, and needs uh, a special, quite aggressive management. But there is a very little dynamics of intracranial pressure. And as opposed to this, following traumatic brain injury, we can see that pressure may fluctuate over a longer period of time. This is an example of refractory intracranial hypertension Pressure increased from 20 millimeter of mercury. This is a whole period of 14 hours. So first few hours pressure was okay. Patients has been just admitted to NCCU. And then look what happened further. Intracranial pressure started to increase until reaching kind of the plateau at the level of uh, 60 millimeter of mercury. And this has been, moreover, associated with a little bit decrease in arterial pressure here. In pressure. Therefore, cerebral perfusion pressure gone down, gone down to zero. Uh, perfusion of the brain has been stopped. Obviously, patient died. But these two patterns of intracranial pressure so that uh, really continuous monitoring of intracranial pressure is mandatory. Now about other things. And the number, therefore, we need to think about the faster transients of intracranial pressure. Transients of intracranial pressure are of various nature. Uh, the most classical intrinsic it's so-called plateau waves of ICP. ICP increases suddenly from 20 here to almost 60 millimeter of mercury, reaches plateau, and then this is over a few minutes, this is seven minutes in fact altogether, decreases spontaneously. What it is? It is reaction to sudden uh, intrinsic vasodilation the, uh, of brain vessels. So we have this vasodilation, and that's a model of so-called vasodilatatory cascade proposed by Michael Rosner in the 1990s. So 
this is positive feedback loop. So we are traveling from this point to this point. Then here we reach maximal vasodilation, pressure stops to rise, obviously, and then we are waiting for any kind of the stimulus of vasoconstriction. Once again, it may be internal, intrinsic, the stimulus for vasoconstriction, then vasodilatatory cascade reverts to these directions and ICP decreases. Plateau waves, as I said, appear suddenly and usually they terminate uh, spontaneously. They are relatively short, around 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and this is example of long-term monitoring of intracranial pressure. This is about two days of patients with relatively stable and increased intracranial pressure around 20, 25 millimeter of mercury. And then after the first day of monitoring, some irregularities of ICP appear. These are plateau waves. Uh, the trouble is that in these particular patients, and this can be seen extremely uh, uh, seldom in uh, clinical practice. In our clinical practice, we have a library of some uh, 1,500 uh, long-term monitoring of intracranial pressure. This is only one monitoring like that. First way, second wave, and then, unfortunately, seven wave pressure increased and never gone back. The patient died, unfortunately. So this is an example that the plateau waves <coughs> are not always that much benign. They may <coughs> produce a, a permanent intracranial hypertension associated with a fatal outcome. And this is an example of such a long plateau wave. This is ICP. Baseline was 30 millimeter of mercury during plateau wave pressure increased to 50 millimeter of mercury. Cerebral perfusion pressure decreased a little bit below 50 millimeter of mercury. So we know that this is ischemic level of cerebral perfusion pressure. And then everything lasted not 10 minutes, but one hour. If we see such a long elevation of intracranial pressure, we need to do something to reverse vasodilatatory cascade. Short-term hyperventilation is a good trick because it causes vasoconstriction and ICP may settle after a few seconds in short-term um, ventilation, maybe a few seconds, maybe 20, half of a million or something like this. And this is something like the therapeutical termination of plateau wave of intracranial pressure caused by Ambubac um, ventilation. Now, further from the transient, a little bit about pass waveform of intracranial pressure. It's very complex. And this is probably the best book ever written about ICP pass away from its meaning. It's very complex. And we still have a lot of questions about its uh, meaning and information included in um, uh, pass away from. Like this dot. Can be classically explained by pressure along y-axis, volume curve. Pressure volume curve is a little bit more complicated than Tom Langfitt showed uh, in early 1960s and has uh, three sections. The first section is proportional rise of intracranial pressure, very slow when the intracerebral volume increases. Then it's exponential. Then past some critical ICP starts to bend 
to the right again. If we imagine that pulse waveform of intracranial pressure is a response of the system to pulsatile excitation, continuous periodical excitation of the blood inflowing to the brain, blood inflows to the brain in pulsations, you can see that in this region, we call it good compensatory reserve because pressure doesn't drag to volume that much. Pulse waveform is small. Then on the exponential part, it starts to increase with mean intracranial pressure. <coughs> and then past critical ICP, it decreases again. So the concept of this critical intracranial pressure is very important in intensive care. And we can uh, monitor this with index called RAP. This is correlation coefficient between what happens to intracranial pressure and what happens to amplitude. Here RAP is zero in this area, simply because it's proportional. Here, RAP is close to plus one because <coughs> amplitude will be increasing with increasing intracranial pressure. And then here it switches to negative value because here past critical ICP, past amplitude will be decreasing with rising ICP. <coughs> so this is a relationship between ICP and amplitude. It's not traumatic brain injury, it's hydrocephalus. And then we can observe what happens here around this breakpoint. Amplitude is constant and then starts to increase proportionally to intracranial pressure when we plot pulse amplitude versus mean intracranial pressure. And here is an example of this, what happens when ICP increases very uh, high. And this is a picture recording from refractory intracranial hypertension. A three days period, pressure was quite settled at the very beginning. And then finally, third day after traumatic brain injury, patient developed intracranial hypertension, and uh, finally he died. Pulse amplitude increased here with mean intracranial pressure, but then when intracranial pressure was very high, it started to decrease. Therefore, if we plot amplitude versus intracranial pressure, we will see upper breakpoint of amplitude pressure correct in the relationship. This point, it's a point of the critical intracranial pressure. And we need to monitor this continuously to avoid uh, death caused directly by intracranial hypertension. And this is an example of using this RAP coefficient in a patient, long-term monitoring more than 10 days of intracranial pressure, which was elevated at the beginning, then settled. And the reason for elevation was a brain edema. So RAP was able, and this is an example to show you, uh, to detect the reverse of the brain edema. Here was a tied brain, RAP close to plus one, which settled over a few later days down to zero, good compensatory reserve. And that was a patient who had a good outcome following traumatic brain injury. Few words about autoregulation. Uh, autoregulation is almost everything for the brain. If brain is autoregulated, it is happy. Cerebral blood flow is constant, even if mean arterial blood pressure or cerebral perfusion pressure um, changes a lot. This is the image of eight, uh, of seven years old um, girl who promised to uh, produce the illustration for the cover of her mom 
PhD thesis somewhere in uh, Denmark. But the real curve, it's called Lassen curve, looks like that. Here it's recording of ICP, cerebral perfusion pressure, and cerebral blood flow velocity is a surrogate for cerebral blood flow in a scenario of intracranial hypertension. This is experimental recording once again. So CPP gone down and uh, look what happened to flow velocity. If we plot flow velocity versus cerebral perfusion pressure, we see loss in curve. This is uh, a good stabilization of cerebral blood flow. If um, CPP decreases from 80 to 40 millimeter of mercury, cerebral blood flow is continuously uh, maintained. Therefore, this is a region of good autoregulation. And here it's upper breakpoint of autoregulation and lower breakpoint of autoregulation, below or above which the cerebral blood flow is uh, pressure passive. We can try to do uh, the trick using mean arterial blood pressure and mean intracranial pressure. If we uh, filter out all fast components of two pressures and leave only slow waves, we can compare these slow waves of arterial blood pressure and ICP. And if relationship is negative between these two slow waves, this is ABP and intracranial pressure, uh, vessels are reacting actively to changes in arterial blood pressure. We call correlation coefficients between five minute series of ABP average, ICP average over 10 seconds, PRX, pressure reactivity index. If it's negative, autoregulation is good. If the relationship is passive, correlation coefficient is positive. Uh, Autoregulation is unfortunately not functional. This PRX has been taken uh, by a lot of colleagues worldwide. Ken Brady in John Hopkins Institution did a series of experiments showing that this increase in PRX below lower limit of autoregulation, and he checked what was the lower limit of autoregulation using golden standard cerebral blood flow method is a marker of lower limit of autoregulation by itself. And detection of lower limit of autoregulation using PRX got the very, very um, good area of the curve, 0.9. Is the clinical test or the area under the curve for the tech, the clinical fact uh, with such a value? It means that this is very, very good test. Lucius Steiner, who did his PhD project in Cambridge, also uh, correlated PRX with static rate of autoregulation and showed the good um, in a group of patients. Got good correlation between PRX and static rate of autoregulation. <clears throat> PRX, we found, is very good for observing <coughs> future uh, trends of intracranial pressure. Here is a story of the patient um, with normal intracranial pressure and then few days following uh, head injury, he developed intracranial hypertension. If you look at PRX here, uh, you can see that this is around zero or even negative. It's fluctuating in time, so you need to time average this. But uh, half of a day before rise of intracranial pressure, PRX uh, on average switched from negative to positive values. And this is maybe the early warning that something will happen in the future. Lucius Steiner analyzed intracranial pressure, PRX, and cerebral perfusion pressure in a retrospective series of 
100 patients and found that from all patients together, this distribution of PRX versus cerebral perfusion pressures got a U shape, presents a, with a U shape curve. For low cerebral perfusion pressure, PRX is positive. For high cerebral perfusion pressure, PRX is also positive. And in between, it reaches a value which has been called optimal cerebral perfusion pressure. So that will be optimal cerebral perfusion pressure of this cohort of patients, around 70 millimeter of mercury. Also, individual patients, if you do the same distribution from the all measurement points um, and every measurement points coming to the computer every 10 seconds, produce this specific picture of optimal cerebral perfusion pressure. Further you are from optimal cerebral perfusion pressure indicates that probably your outcome will be not very good. So good outcome here with a low distance between CPP and CPPO. And here patients who died with significantly higher distance. That has been picked up by Dr. Schmielewski and Dr. Arias. And then they found that the uh, shorter time window, not whole monitoring time, it's useful for looking at optimal cerebral perfusion pressure. This is distribution of PRX versus CPP from four hours window. And uh, Dr. Arias found that in a Again, big cohort of patients, around 300 traumatic brain injury patients. If CPP is lower than CPP optimal, chances to die are much higher. And if CPP is higher than CPP optimal, chances to or incidence to attain severe disability are higher. Undoubtedly, best outcome is around CPP optimal. This has been picked up by many scientists and uh, we propose so-called optimal CPP-oriented therapy. First trial, cogitate, average, uh, oriented on uh, feasibility and uh, feasibility and safety of following CPP optimal given by computer in a real scenario of intensive care of traumatic brain injury patients show that both uh, it's feasible and um, uh, safe for head injury patients. We are now waiting for phase three trial, looking at the possibility or assessment of whether outcome may improve if we follow CPP optimal or not. And this is something specially for Ruben, because I know that he is interested in spinal cord um, uh, injury. Uh, if we measure spinal cord pressure, PRX can be calculated the same way and optimal value for um, spinal cord perfusion pressure can be found. The patients who are monitored, who are managed with uh, spinal cord <coughs> pressure, perfusion pressure close to optimal are having the better outcome. At least they can avoid the spinal cord ischemia. Another <coughs> modality is cerebral blood flow. Here is an example of Hemedex, uh, which is a thermodilution methodology. Possible intraparenchymal placement of the probe produce continuous information about uh, cerebral blood flow. And here is example of response of cerebral blood flow with Hemedex, continuous monitoring to changes the little fluctuations of and tidal CO2. Also, slow waves of intracranial pressure 
are picked up well with slow waves of soluble blood flow. So they are coherent, they are correlated in time. If we are uh, lucky, long-term monitoring, this is three days period, of cerebral blood flow and cerebral perfusion pressure gives us possibility to, if we plot cerebral blood flow versus cerebral perfusion pressure, if we plot, gives us possibility to enjoy, appreciate Lassen curve with upper and lower limit of autoregulation. Unfortunately, Hemelex got the uh, disadvantage. This disadvantage is periodical uh, re-zeroing of the uh, probe. So every notch here, it's a period where measurement switches off and then the uh, system re-zeroes itself. And then you can see that the most important fluctuations of cerebral blood flow are related to re-zeroing artifacts uh, of cerebral blood flow, like here. It means that the uh, probe uh, drifts, zero drifts uh, during the uh, measurements. This is a long-term monitoring, 18 hours period. In short-term monitoring, it may behave very well, like here during plateau wave of intracranial pressure, uh, only a few minutes, and then in reaction to cerebral perfusion pressure, cerebral blood flow decreases. So we are working below lower limit of autoregulation. Little bit about brain chemistry. First of all, tissue oxygenation. It's a local measurement, and to have all these um, uh, invasive um, intraparenchymal probes, we need to have the good cranial access device. This is our own cranial access device produced by the, the workshop of Allen Brooks Hospital, and we are using this in our neurocritical care unit. Brain tissue oxygenation reacts to changes in ICP and cerebral perfusion pressure. This is a long-term monitoring. Here are plateau waves of intracranial pressure. Each plateau wave is related to decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure. And look at this decrease in brain tissue oxygenation. It means that the dynamic response of brain tissue oxygenation is, is, is relatively good. Here is another example, refractory intracranial hypertension, rise in intracranial pressure, decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure, and also uh, decrease in brain tissue oxygenation. But if we take a long-term intracranial pressure monitoring and brain tissue oxygenation monitoring is brain tissue, uh, over a longer period, without such uh, dramatic events like refractory intracranial hypertension, we can see that the relationship between brain tissue oxygenation and cerebral perfusion pressure or intracranial pressure is not very uh, smooth and easy for uh, evaluation. This is relationship between brain tissue oxygenation and cerebral perfusion pressure. Correlation is very poor, and this is between brain tissue oxygenation and ICP. Correlation is even worse. We would expect, probably, for very low cerebral perfusion pressure, low brain tissue oxygenation and very high, higher it is here, but there is no correlation with intracranial pressure whatsoever. Colleagues from Leipzig, Matthias Jäger, and Martin Schumann uh, proposed index of autoregulation based on brain tissue oxygenation, so-called ORX, Oxygen Reactivity Index. It's the same as BRX, but correlation was between brain tissue oxygenation and cerebral perfusion pressure. 
positive ORX, they claim, is associated with passive autoregulation, not working autoregulation, and no correlation. It's a, a good autoregulation. We try to replicate this data, but whatever we've done, uh, we correlated PRX versus ORX in uh, not very big, but around 100 patients. And the correlation between PRX and ORX was always poor. So we cannot affirm this uh, uh, hypothesis that ORX will be good um, uh, marker of cerebral outregulation of cerebral blood flow. And then finally, microdialysis. Microdialysis picks up the chemical makeup of extracellular fluid. Measurement is very local. Measurement uh, is uh, not continuous, is intermittent. Classically, every hour we can appreciate the content of lactate, pyruvate, glycerol, glutamate, other compounds which we uh, need to predefine for our macroanalysis uh, measurement. The most important is lactate pyruvate ratio, which is a marker of ischemia. Values are around probably 20, 25, increasing above 30. Uh, it means that ischemia is aggravating. Here is long-term monitoring, three days monitoring with microanalysis of all our signals, CPP, ICP, PRX, brain tissue oxygenation, and lactate polyvalent ratio. And then we can see slow increase of lactate polyvalent ratio up to 30 and above 30 millimeter of mercury. Deterioration of autoregulation, PRX is going positive. This is shown as this red color here. Green, it means good autoregulation. Red means disturbed autoregulation. And remarkably, this is bad thing about brain tissue oxygenation. We don't see any deterioration of brain tissue oxygenation, even a little bit increased in this, in this area. Okay. That will be about elements of contemporary invasive uh, brain monitoring. Few words about integration. We produced a lot of signals and a lot of parameters, direct, indirect, calculated. They all have some physiological interpretation. You need to have the computer to show all of them by the bedside. This is our first uh, computer in Cambridge. Uh, the software called ICM, Intensive Care Monitor, has been written by myself in 1980s when I was working in Poland. Uh, and then we uh, uh, transferred all concept to Cambridge in 1991. The first versions were very, very crude, but Peter Schmielewski, finishing his um, uh, PhD project, picked up the idea of multimodal monitoring and look, he produced the software, which did, didn't have that much opportunity to calculate derived indices, but at least integrated, uh, recorded signals very well. Look at this, how multimodal monitoring works. This is ICP, this is CPP. This is NIROS brain um, oxygenated hemoglobin. So you can see that any kind of rise of ICP and decrease in CPP is associated with decrease of oxygenated hemoglobin. That is NIROS, one of the first recorded is NIROS. This is SJO2. It doesn't work very well, but as jo 2 has got all these problems with long-term drifts, um, recalibration and all, all together. And here is transcranial Doppler blood flow velocity. So 
transcranial Doppler blood flow velocity was 11 of multimodal monitoring. However, this is not invasive. And here, moreover, was laser Doppler flow metry cortical blood flow, also reacting to changes in, in intracranial pressure. So this is integration of all signals in one without calculation of the derived indices. Peter then took ICM old version and written on the basis of its architecture ICM plus software, which we are uh, using uh, the nowadays contemporary. So signals from various monitors were taken for analysis, primary, secondary. They so were forming some virtual signals. And finally, after several calculations, these calculations can be programmed by the operator, produce the final trends. And a lot of different uh, monitoring devices in neurocritical care have their own interfaces. So it took a long time to produce the interfaces from all possible monitoring devices to introduce signal uh, to intracranial pressure. And this is Hemedex, this is intracranial pressure, this is brain tissue examination, brain tissue examination again, and so on and so forth. A lot of monitors and a lot of different interfaces. And also a lot of secondary indices which inform us about physiology of the system. PRX, this is autoregulation. RAP, this is compensatory reserve. Obviously, uh, we have the possibility to appreciate baroreflex sensitivity if we are interested in possible dysautonomia. And then we can monitor uh, the critical closing pressure and the tension of arterial walls in the brain. We can appreciate entropy and we can uh, use various uh, non-invasive methods, MX, COX. This is based on TCD, this is based on NIROS to monitor uh, cerebral autoregulation. The message to take home, ICP is still the king. Dynamics of ICP is probably equally important as absolute value. We can monitor compensatory reserve using pulse waveform analysis of intracranial pressure. Pressure reactivity index is a simple measure of cerebral autoregulation, global cerebral autoregulation, because it's propagated by the pressure. Is optimal CPP a way to improve TBI management? It remains to be shown using uh, next phase cogitate trial. Brain tissue oxygenation using glycox. It's local, but it gives us uh, good transients showing uh, what happens to value of oxygen content in the brain. Cerebral blood flow, uh, it's also local and it's got these um, problems with calibration artifacts. And finally, microanalysis, still intermittent, but continuous monitoring is just around the corner. Continuous monitoring of lactate private ratio with a sampling frequency of one minute is at the moment prototype of this, it's at the moment tested in Cambridge. So um, we don't need to get the sample of the extra cellular fluid in like in modern micro contemporary microanalysis, but we will be able to use another intraparenchymal transducer to see lactate per ratio changing continuously.
And finally, many thanks to my colleagues and all the research team in Cambridge and abroad. I also need to thank very much to Professor Picard, who, as I said, invited us in 1991, and probably he didn't predict that we'll be sitting in Cambridge for such a long time. Certainly, we didn't predict at, at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, Ruben, you, you are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I will thank you very much you for, the, for this enlightening lecture and for, for giving us uh, this deep side of the, of the brain autoregulation and all the parameters we can have in, in multimodal uh, monitoring in, in critical ill patients. And um, I'm, I have some questions for you. One, one of them is that there is a lot of parameters now that you can calculate, but still in Spain, most of the ICUs don't get this kind of fancy uh, computer interface to get the calculations in, in, in real time. So um, sometimes we can see here that you have uh, uh, in, in invasive tissular oxygen, oxygen monitoring, sometimes microdialysis, uh, ICP, but you only get the number and uh, you try to, to integrate everything, uh, just seeing the number without any kind of, of computer aid. Do you think that that uh, makes sense today? Or uh, if you don't have that kind of, of computer interface, it's better just to look to one parameter and, and not taking any data more than that because you are not squeezing the, 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 what, what you can have just for, for the ICP, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what can I tell you? Uh, the, keeping in mind my uh, conflict of interest, I can tell you that ICM Plus is uh, uh, available commercially from Cambridge Enterprise Limited. You can find ICM Plus using the Google. You can find details of, and a lot of centers all over the world are using this software. So they are using and then conduct ma management of head injured patients or critically ill neuro patients. Uh, using the same set of parameters. It's easy to compare. Around 120 or nowadays, probably 150 centers all over the world are using this, this software. So it's easy to acquire. Moreover, I can tell you it's not very expensive. You can install this uh, on many uh, computers in your NCCU, so every bed space may have own laptop. You know, laptops are very, very cheap. They are very easily to be uh, to be installed on NCCU, and such a work, such a setup, uh, uh, produce environment in which not a single kilobyte of information is lost. It may be appreciated online, when we care for our patients, it may be appreciated offline, when we need to analyze, to synthesize some uh, work, some periods of recording. And if we want to write a PhD thesis, good paper uh, to nature neurology or something like this, people are doing that. So it's not that, uh, uh, this is not available. Okay, thank you, Marek. Um, and I have a question for the audience uh, about the percutaneous regional oxygen saturation. And the, the, if you have any experience about uh, that, you know, that kind of, of uh, stuff that they 
put on the on the front of the head of the patient just to calculate how is the the um, the, the brain of, um, oxygenation is go, going. And do you have a, any thoughts about that? And is there any utility in autoregulation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We use NIROS because you probably talk about near infrared spectroscopy. Yes. Yeah. I didn't talk about near infrared spectroscopy because you specifically wanted to have invasive uh, methodology to be discussed today. Near infrared spectroscopy is very good for continuous monitoring of cerebral autoregulation. And this is non invasive. The trouble is that the correlation between brain tissue oxygenation with NIROS, um, if you want to do it non invasively, you don't have cerebral perfusion pressure. Okay, because cerebral, to, to evaluate cerebral perfusion pressure, you need to have invasive ICP. Uh, so you correlate brain tissue oxygenation with changes in arterial blood pressure. Uh, and this is a kind of the convenient shortcut, but very convenient in clinical practice. In the United States, colleagues are using uh, this concept uh, during cardiac surgery for the brain protection and looking at optimal arterial blood pressure in France, they are using this in patients um, on ECMO, just again from brain protection. In our center, we are using this for brain protection of preterm neonates, looking at optimal arterial blood pressure, the same as the optimal cerebral perfusion pressure, but without necessity of monitoring of intracranial pressure. Thank you so much. And then one last question because we are getting out of time and it's about entropy. Um, we have seen some papers in the last five years yeah. about entropy in, in as a, a predictor of outcome in, in, uh, in TBI and subarachnoidal hemorrhage. And uh, we, are, uh, we have here a, a feed that is doing his uh this is about that so it's feeding about that and um do you think that's um a real new parameter that is going to uh to go ahead uh into monitoring or is just uh, it's a kind of mode that is being in for 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 us in, in the last years and it's going to dissipate what do you think? Uh, entropy is, uh, is a mathematical um, uh, parameter. It means it doesn't care about underlying physiology or pathophysiology. It cares about the numbers. If very general rule is that if entropy decreases, something wrong is going with the system, complexity of the system. This time we are monitoring the brain and uh, the complexity of regulation uh, of the system decreases. And this is in most cases associated with uh, process of dying, unfortunately. And therefore, entropy may be a good index of for, for, for prediction of outcome. There was no uh, mm, uh, prospective trial in this direction. Uh, entropy functions are incorporated in ICM plus software, so they are easy to use. They are really in the library of functions. You just put, I want entropy um, of, for example, intracranial pressure or entropy of PRX displayed as one of the secondary parameters on the screen. And, and do you think but this is a very interesting concept, potentially very useful. And, and do you think that uh, the, the, the brain loses entropy before it started to, 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 to show any sign of deterioration? 
it yeah. can be used yeah. as, a, as a parameter a, that leads that's a good that's a good question you use the word before and we are not certain about this how uh, well decrease in entropy anticipates physiological phenomena which are um, characteristic for let's say brain ischemia deterioration of circulation increasing intracranial pressure we we don't know that we know that they follow each other, but uh, whether uh, deterioration of entropy anticipates deterioration of the brain function because of disturbed physiology, we don't know yet. Thank you very much. I, I think we have uh, no more time. Uh, Thank you. It was a pleasure for us. It was a very enlightening lecture. I hope we can have you here in the next I future. Hope. I love, uh, I love, I love, I love northern Spain. Here, here, the weather is not so good as in the south of Spain. You know, yeah, no, I know you are on the Bay of Biscay. <laughs> <laughs> but you will be but very. We fun. are even worse because we are on the North Sea. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank Mark. you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.